Welcome to the Salty Witches Podcast. I'm your host, Austin. I'm doing the podcast alone tonight. Mike is unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, fortunately, uh, teaching a class tonight. And Wendy is um, a little preoccupied with a reading. So I'm going to go ahead and just going to do a little mini episode just to tide you all over until next week. Um, For those of you who are listening, I want you to know how much we appreciate you. We're going to answer a listener question, and I'm going to be discussing tonight some things that are centered around Samhain, as well as um, ways to prepare yourself magically for the day. Um, And that's actually based off an interaction that I had with a customer in the shop yesterday. Um, But we'll get into that later. So first and foremost... Tis the season of the witch. Happy Samhain. Uh, if you celebrate it, if not, happy whatever else you celebrate. I'm actually a Shadowfest guy myself, so um, I usually celebrate Shadowfest. I'm not very much of a Samhain person. I did Samhain for many, many years um, as a gardenerian. Um, I don't necessarily do that anymore, though. So I am leading a public Samhain ritual on the 29th. It is free to attend for those of you who are local. Call the shop 801-601-1795 to get registered and we'll get you in. Let's move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and read the listener question that I have. There we go. Hello, I just listened to your episode on graveyard slash cemetery etiquette. Very informative episode, by the way. I'm so glad you like it. It's, I can't stress enough how important it is to have etiquette in a cemetery um, and when you're dealing with dead folk i cannot stress it enough okay um, if you have not listened to that episode or if you need a refresher go back listen to that episode and really really take note okay um, at the end of it you mentioned you were about to go on a trip to denver colorado area and that you were going to check out some metaphysical shops this was Last year, this was September. Wow. (laughs) Um, uh, I'm curious to see if you found any that that you would recommend. I live about 45 minutes southwest of Denver in the mountains in a very small town. We have a hodgepodge of shops in the area that provide... Yeah, okay. Okay, so... Okay. Okay. So you're asking about the shops that we went to in Denver. Um, We went to a few really awesome shops in Denver... I gotta say, my favorite shop that we went to was Ritual Craft. We went to a lot of the metaphysical shops in the area, and Ritual Craft really just took the cake. The entire aesthetic of Ritual Craft is really cool. I mean, they have plants, they have an altar to Hecate right in the middle, they focus a lot on local things, Um, they have a really awesome supply of books, good tarot cards, they have in-house formulators, so I gotta say, Ritual Craft is 10 out of 10 recommend, okay? Um, if you haven't been to Ritual Craft or Cat and Cauldron, take a trip through the Rocky Mountains, go see Ritual Craft, and then come through Utah and come see us, or go through Utah and see us to get to Ritual Craft. We would love to see you. So... I would suggest Ritual Craft. There were a few others that were there, but really, most of the time that we were there, we spent um, enjoying some of the really good food. There was really good food there. Um, And honestly, just enjoying the mountain air. It was lovely. (laughs) Um, It was clean. Um, It was just really nice. So I hope that helps. Not very helpful, I'm sure. But Ritual Craft is the place to go. They have lots of really awesome apothecary things. Um, everything that you could possibly need to do any form of witchcraft that you're looking for. So, with a gnarly tattoo, with a gnarly tattoo shop next door. So, okay. So let's talk about why things are going bump in the night more frequently. So as I record this episode, it is October 18th, 2023. Um, we are over halfway through the month of October and since the autumnal equinox, which is September 21st, 21st to the 23rd. Um, since then, there has been um, an uptick, essentially, in supernatural occurrences, paranormal activities, spiritual activity, and that's awesome. But a lot of people who are new, or this is their first year, and th- th- this is someone's first season of The Witch, 
it can be a lot. So here's some tips and some tricks just to help you on along the way. So that way, hopefully one, you can survive and two, so that way you aren't getting too freaked out, hopefully. First and foremost, things are gonna go bump in the night. When you start practicing witchcraft, just like everything else I talked about this last week, there is a risk. There is a risk that you might call something towards you that is potentially malefic or nefarious. This is very rare. This is very few and far between, but it does happen. So the first line of action and the first plan of action you need to have is during this season, from the autumnal equinox all the way up through the winter equinox up until about February 1st-ish, really increase your grounding, centering, and aligning. Keeping your energy close to you, keeping your energy flowing, unencumbered. This is really, really, really important because as witches, we are in tune to nature around us, or at least we should be, right? We are attuned to these things, and because we're attuned to them, it's important for us to really keep a focus on them, okay? And allow us to move and function appropriately. Um, that's the first step to making sure that everything's not absolutely, absolutely cuckoo bonkers crazy. Second thing that you need to do is maybe instead of cleansing right out the gate, it might be a really good idea for you to, to actually try some of your divination skills. Uh, now is the time and this is the year, uh, this is the time of year to really practice, hone, and focus your divination skills as a witch. It's easier to communicate with things. You can, you know, shuffle and pull cards and it works really, 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 really well. Uh, you can light a candle and simply just talk to the spirits. Um, this is a great time to do liminal and or dream work. So these are some really great things that you can do and should be doing before grabbing your bundle of rosemary to cleanse your space. Change of scenery. So um, as we come to the end of the podcast, I wanted to show this is a hood lamp. I like this when I do my readings. Um, I catch all the wax and then I throw it away afterwards um okay so last week mike talked about a deck that he got and i'm going to talk about a deck that i'm absolutely loving right now okay so this deck that i love is the seasons of the witch Solon oracle i love all the seasons of the witch decks i've not been impressed by not i have not not been impressed by one yet so i'm gonna do a little bit of a read for you for those online and for those listening to the podcast let's see one card one card what what is the advice overall that can be given to you to continue to grow along your path this season of the witch and to continue to really dive deep and connect to your roots and connect to your practice. I don't read jumpers, uh, mainly because that's just me being a sloppy uh, shuffler. <laughs> so, all right, one card, rebirth. So as we look at the rebirth card here in the Seasons of the Witch, Solemn Oracle, um, you can look, the, look up the rebirth card online, I do believe. Um, it's a time for you to forgive yourself. Uh, understand that this has been a hard year for a lot of people. It's probably been a hard year for a lot of witches. There's been some really weird shit floating around, really weird things. And so if you're one of those people who just feels like everything has burned up around you, remember that like a phoenix, we will rise from the ashes. Take the time now um, in this next week to do some work on releasing what you're holding on to. There's a lot of stuff that we're holding on to this year. And if we can let that go at the fires and hand that over to the fires at Shadowfest or Samhain, hand that over to the ancestors, what we're going to see is they're going to take that, transmute it, and bring something really awesome to life for us. So other than that, we don't have any other 
questions, um, but essentially to survive this, this season of Samhain or the season of the witch, as we continue to move further into it, it's just a matter of keeping yourself grounded, keeping yourself aligned and not approaching things with fear. Remember, again, I've said this a lot lately and it rings true for pretty much everyone. If you're strong enough to call it, you're strong enough to get rid of it, okay? Like, share, follow, and subscribe on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all those places, TikTok. Um, get, get in, see those things, watch some of our videos. We are always posting educational things. Uh, book a reading with one of our readers or our psychics. If you haven't had a chance to yet, they can do phone readings. I don't need you here to do a reading, uh, neither do any of my other readers. And uh, maybe look at taking some online classes or attending some of the rituals, okay? Uh, other than that, happy witching, stay salty saltines, and next week I think we are going to have a few more people on the episode, including Mike, and I think it's going to be really, really great. If you have any questions, send them on over. Happy witching. Now, if you feel that you really need to cleanse your space, there's nothing wrong with that. But remember, we want to make sure that we are respecting the spirits that are there. If we're going to use something like smoke, like rosemary, right? Um, you light up that bundle of rosemary or you throw some rosemary in charcoal. It's not actually the smoke that's pushing the energy out. Um, some cultures do believe that. But what we're doing is we're marking the space as pure and protected. Okay, so if you're wanting to make a space that is peaceful and you're wanting to make a space that is more in alignment with spirit communication, something you can do is you can blend some rosemary, some mugwort, a little bit of lavender, and then just to add a little bit of protection, you can throw in just a little smidgen of mugwort. We already said mugwort, of frankincense and myrrh. Okay, and then you burn this on a charcoal. And basically you move this through the space and you mark it as this is a safe haven for spirits. This is a safe haven for me. And you only burn this in a place where you're going to communicate with them because it's going to build up a charge in that area. And as it builds up a charge in that area, you're going to find that a lot of really awesome things can happen in that area. You'll get clear spirit communication. You'll be able to really tap in and hone into spirits, needs, wants, and desires. And it's going to be a really good place for you to kind of keep things organized. Um, when we first opened the shop here, we raised an altar to the dead um, to um, basically kind of honor and welcome in the spirits of the season. And for like two weeks, it was just dead here in the shop. We were like, what is going on? So we did a reading and we found that the energy from the altar was seeping out. So we went, we kind of pulled that energy in and we contained it. And as soon as we did that, everything picked back up and then things were contained a little bit more. So as you're working through and you're continuing to work on these things, especially if you're just budding in your practice, I wouldn't suggest doing that. But one way to make sure that a space is locked down from spirits or for spirits is to create a very, very simple crystal grid. For this, all you need is four pieces of black obsidian and a quartz. That's all you're going to need. The quartz is going to go um, in the center of the of the place, on uh, the center of the altar. It's going to be your generator. You're then going to take the obsidian, the black obsidian, and you're going to charge the black obsidian to create an energetic boundary, an energetic boundary that nothing negative can cross in and nothing that would be disruptive to the household can cross out of. Now, if you're like me and you live in a house full of spirits and full of witches, you don't really have that luxury. So we just kind of deal with it as we do. But for those who are just beginning, creating this very simple grid is how we would do that. To program a crystal, a lot of people are like, well, you need to cleanse it, cleanse it first. I don't really necessarily believe in that. Most crystals are really good about keeping their energy and their spirit aligned. So first, you're going to hold that quartz. And however you charge up things, if you're a visualizing person, you can visualize um, electric blue fire coming down, moving through you and moving into that crystal and charging it up, creating um, almost like a battery. 
and allowing it to anchor, allowing it to anchor to your altar. And then with the obsidian, you will connect each piece of obsidian to that quartz. You'll touch it and then you'll take the obsidian and you'll put it in the four corners, one in each corner of the room after you've touched it. What this is going to do is it's going to connect that energy, send it outwards and create a grid that basically locks down an area pretty effectively. If you want to add an even bigger grounding implement to this at the cross quarters, um, so if you're doing a stone north, south, east, and west at the cross quarters, so northeast, southeast, southwest, etc., etc., you can do hematite. What this is going to do is it's going to create a cycle and a circuit of energy that is going to consistently keep that boundary going. It's going to ground out any malefic energies and forces, and it's going to help keep that space locked down until you're ready to send something out. Now, something that I always have to remind people of is when you are doing protection magic, when you're doing cleansing magic, when you're doing this type of stuff, you want to make sure that you're not removing all of the things, right? There are people who will cleanse every single time with rue, and rue is lovely, but rue is like spiritual freaking bleach. And rue will strip everything. So if you cleanse with rue, you're going to find that it's a little bit more difficult to keep things sealed up. And there's nothing wrong with that. But once you cleanse with Rue, you want to go back through, redo your protection rituals, redo your wards, just to make sure that they're still there and they get an extra amp and an extra charge. Okay? Now, something else that you want to take into account when you are protecting is that you're not overprotecting. Sometimes those spirits that are moving through that are going bump in the night are the spirits that have been around us this entire time. But the reason that they're louder now is because we are more aware, we're more open to them, and we are more susceptible to those things at this time of year. And so as they move around and as things go bump, in the night and as things move or you know you remember setting something down here and then you move it somewhere else as you go through this understand that these things probably are happening consistently just not on such a large level so don't freak out don't don't think that you're under spiritual attack because you're not um you're just experiencing some spiritual activity and it's the spiritual activity that most of us who are already sensitive experience year round and now you're kind of getting a taste of that and it can be a little spooky but remember there is no fear in witchcraft always remember that if you're strong enough to call it and attract it you're strong enough and powerful enough to banish it all right now last thing i want to talk about when it comes to preparing for Solon or Shadowfest, or Tenebris. This is a time for the dead. And depending on your traditions, there might be different things that you do. One of my favorite traditions for Samhain is to host a uh, dead supper, okay? And when you host a dead supper, basically you set a plate for the dead. We talked about this actually, I think a couple podcasts ago. Um, but you set a plate at the table with a candle and you're completely silent during the entire time you eat because what you're doing is you're giving that spirit a space to experience food to experience life one more time and as you place the food as you've created the food and you place the food at the table you silently acknowledge these spirits and call them in this is an easy way to honor the dead and to work with those lines of energy. Now, another thing that's really, really easy to do for Samhain um, or Tenebris or Shadowfest, astral work. This is a time where you could anoint yourself with some oil or anoint yourself with a flying ointment, a safe, trusted flying ointment. Don't just slather yourself into Torah. That's not gonna be good for anyone, okay? <laughs> um, and do some focused, intensive spirit flight. Find your favorite guided meditation. Find uh, a path working that you really have been wanting to try and record it. Uh, go for a walk. 
in the evening with a walking stick and use that chance to collect some sprawl or some power. So that way, as you move into the dark times of the year, you are even further connected to the currents of magic that are happening. So those are just a few things you can do about this time of year that can help alleviate some of the stress. Um, I always keep a candle burning during this time of year. I Obviously, I blow it out before I leave, but as soon as I get home, I light a candle. I usually keep it by a window. Um, and the idea is that by keeping this candle lit, you are giving spirits an opportunity to find their way home or find their way to where they need to go. Uh, and I think that's a pretty cool tradition. I mean, my mama did it. My Nona did it. I do it. Um, even sometimes during holidays, we'll, we'll light a candle next to the front door just to, just to make sure that whatever anyone brings with them that goes with them as well. Um, those are just, so those are just a few suggestions. Um, look into your community. You know, we're doing a free public Samhain ritual here. There are lots of other places who do Samhain rituals, um, who do public Sabbath rituals. Look into those and allow yourself to step outside of your comfort zone and attend some of those public things. Uh, this is probably one of the best times of year to actually connect to people. This is the best time of year to go to your favorite local metaphysical shop, um, new age shop, crystal shop, go see a reader, because it's the prime time and it's the prime energies that we're working with and it will truly give you a deeper connection and some deeper access to these things. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, we're going to talk a little bit about how how to prepare for doing readings for others. Okay. Now I know a lot of you out there probably aren't doing readings for others, but if you are, um, or if you've just started and you're finding that it's hard to keep yourself balanced or hard to keep a focus or it's hard to keep a steady steady pulse through your readings without becoming completely disconnected. This is something that is probably gonna be beneficial for you. So I'm just gonna take you through my routine, okay? So today's Wednesday, I'm the reader in the shop. So if I have a chance to sleep in a little bit, um, then I will. I'll sleep in a little bit, just a little bit, not too much. And then I get up and I'll take a shower, okay? While I'm in the shower, um, it serves the physical mundane purposes. You know, it wakes me up, it, you know, physically cleans me. But while I'm doing that, I'm also performing a spiritual cleanse. I'm reciting incantations and prayers to my spirits and talking out loud and listening to some good music. This morning I listened to Lauren and McKinnon. Um, and as I'm washing myself, I'm just focusing on aligning my energies, making sure that I am in alignment to do the work for the people who need it today, and I'm able to give them the answers they need. Not always the answers or the guidance they want. So, clean myself up. I'll usually do some sort of anointing after that. So I'll actually, um, after I get out of the shower, brush my teeth, all that great stuff. Um, as I brush my teeth, I do, do tend to use a little bit of glamour magic there. You know, make sure that even if I have to deliver harsh news, that my words land sweetly on the ear, that they sound fresh and new. Then I'll usually put some lotion in my hands, put a little bit of a particular condition oil. Uh, usually on Wednesdays, I'll do a vision oil just to kind of help keep me open. If I'm working the shop, then I'll usually do a blessing oil or a kind of success oil just to help keep me focused on what I need to be focused on that day. Rub it together and I'll usually rub up. So I'll rub up because I'm trying to pull and draw that energy to me. After you do that, it's time for coffee. So we go upstairs to coffee and, you know, I make my coffee. I sit and I'll sip my coffee. I'll have conversation and I will ground. I will do a good, big, heavy ground. And a lot of the times that looks like me holding my coffee cup staring off in the distance. And so I'll do a big ground. I'll usually play with the dogs for a little bit. And that's another way that you can prepare for your day is if you have an animal friend, take a little extra time. So sorry. Take a little extra time to pay them some attention. Our animal friends have a very grounding presence and they help remind us that 
while it's important that we take things seriously, sometimes, sometimes you just need to make a little bit of noise. Sometimes you just need to be a little crazy. Sometimes you just need to be a little obstinate, Roxy. So um, it's something that really helps us get in touch with our primal self. When we play with our animal friends, our furry, four-legged, our furry, four-legged, our quadruped, four-legged baby friends, whatever Moira says, um, when we play with them, it allows us to get in touch with that primal part of ourselves, which ultimately all of us are connected by. We all have those primal needs. We all need to eat. We all need to sleep. And it helps connect us to that. So I'll play with the doggos. Go downstairs, get ready, and we leave. And the minute I get to the store, I usually will set up my reader's room. Now, when I set up my reader's room, um, this is a space that is shared by all the readers here at Cat and Cauldron. Um, and if you are reading somewhere professionally, you probably, chances chances are, you have other people reading in your space as well. If you don't, and you read out of your own home, or you just read your own, read from your own place, or you do phone readings, great. I still suggest doing something to designate that area as yours. To designate you as the main person in control there. And it's not that I'm there to dominate the energy. It's that I'm there to provide a service, which means if something harmful comes through, I remove it. Okay, so first things first, I have a hood lamp. Um, a hood lamp is something that's used in traditional Cornish craft. Um, it is a horseshoe okay, um, that has a taper candle holder in it. And it's made of iron. And what you do is you put that in, you light it, and usually you'll say a little bit of an incantation. And I light it for every reading, and I light it right at the beginning of the day. So light it, say my incantation. I'll usually burn a little bit of rosemary in the room just to get things flowing, get things moving. Um, if I'm feeling particularly spicy, I'll burn a little bit of mugwort. If I know that I have a lot of mediumship appointments that day, or if I have that feeling I'm going to be talking to a lot of dead folk, and I'll use mugwort because mugwort tends to help keep that in, align and, uh, in alignment and focused. Then I will sit in the room and I will breathe and I will ground the area itself. So to ground an area, you do exactly what you do when you ground yourself, but you allow that grounding influence to move outwards, continuing to move outwards. Because as you're creating that circuit and that circuit gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you help cycle and circulate and ground the energy of that room. Then, at that point, I pull the energy in, center myself, align myself. I am here to serve people today. I am here to give the best and most accurate readings possible and to guide people for their best and highest good. And boom, off we go. If I know that I have a lot of Reiki appointments that day, I will also sit and do a little bit of Reiki on myself, some Reiki meditations, and I'll recite the Reiki precepts also. But if I don't, then I usually don't necessarily worry about those because that's part of my morning process in the morning. So... And that's really pretty much it. I know people who will, um, I've known readers who will clear themselves or will hold a piece of selenite where they're doing readings to help keep them clear. Uh, I've never found that I needed that. I will say that after I've read for a very long time, I feel bigger. It's very weird. I feel like I'm taking up more space. It's probably because my aura is, you know, 10, 20, 15 feet out of my body. And so I will actually have to center myself more than I even need to ground when I'm when I'm doing a reader shift. So I'll pull that energy in periodically, ground, align myself consistently. Um, and that's really all I find that I need to do. 